Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here in my shop. Today is November 7th. This is probably the last day for this radio. So uh, what I want to focus on today is the uh, panelescent screen or light, backlight for this. Uh, something that's given me a couple of minor shocks. And I think it's kind of curious uh, about it. I've done a little bit of research already. Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. It turns out I have another panelescent screen in my house, but I cannot find it. It's nothing more than a small nightlight with kind of a flat surface like this. It glows a very faint green color, but I can't find it. <laughs> I have to wait till the dark, I guess, to find it. So that aside, we're going to look on the internet at a few uh, sites that talk about uh, the panelescent light. The panelescent is actually a kind of a brand name. It's, it's really got a, a more proper technical name. Well, let's just take a look at this one before we get going. So I did get shocks off the edge here. And I did find that I dragged my voltmeter up and down the edge that there is some contact to be made. It's not really visible here. Maybe up here I can see some rust. Down here a little bit of rust too. So um, what this is made up of will be a uh, rigid panel, probably steel, a steel panel, and then a number of layers of materials put on the front. The last couple layers are clear so you can see through them. The deeper inside there's a layer that has phosphorus in it. And it so happens when you apply an electric field across this phosphor layer, the phosphor will glow. And if you have clear panels, the glow will come right through. You can also see that there's a couple of uh, breaks or uh, scrape marks here where the next level of material is exposed right here. Now what exactly that is, I don't know. That may, Maybe that's the actual fluorescent material. I don't know. So this idea was uh, discovered very early on in the 30s, but not really turned into anything too useful until uh, around about this time or a little earlier. Eventually it found its way into quite a few products, especially uh, automotive uh, products, uh, always in the idea of backlighting. And that's why it's here on this clock. Uh, Sylvania, the company that made this clock, had a big, uh, big thing to do with uh, panelescence or pa panelescent panels. This was a bit of their stock and trade, if you like. So this one doesn't appear to work, but that's just how it appears right now. We're going to do a little investigation and see if, in fact, this panel doesn't work. Maybe it's just bad, bad contacts. I'm pretty sure, kind of obviously, these are the contacts up here. I think I put the voltmeter on them and found voltage there. These panels, I believe they need a certain, certain level of voltage uh, to operate. Um, and this one's operating with line voltage, 120 volts. So it, it's maybe a little like a neon bulb in that respect. You know, under 60 not going to happen over 80 it's going to glow something like that is going on uh, so the back panel here is a fiber material we can see uh, rivets going through here you know how, how have they done this exactly looks like you could pop these out these plastic pieces out Popping might be a little difficult. I might end up breaking them if you were to try. Especially now, they'd be uh, brittle. But it looks like if you could take these four corners out, the panel would come off the backing board. And the backing board is probably what's riveted here to the clock. You could probably replace the, the pan panelescent panel, probably, that way. Just be popping these top clips off. Now I haven't moved these clips at all because I know from experience sometimes things like that they're making successful contact. If you just leave them alone they continue to make successful contact. If you move them then you're into a whole problem of uh, rusty surfaces and that. This doesn't quite look like steel here because it's not red rusted. It's just kind of a gray color and this is very crudely done. These, look, at, look at this. This is really crudely done. Almost like an afterthought. So, uh, so why, why these clips? 
and by the way don't you need one clip to go on one layer and the other clip to go on another layer so in between is the is the phosphorus material this look like they're both clipped to the same layer so there could be more about how this is constructed inside I can see I can see some kind of a, a line here I don't know if that's on the camera yeah you can barely see it just above my finger there's a there's a, a white line so maybe there's some structure underneath here we can't really see. Looks like looks like a similar white line here. Come to think of it. And you can see that this this abrasion here where the top surface is chipped off stops right along this line. So there, there, there's some kind of structure in behind here. It'd be really nice if I could make this work. The way it's powered is, is kind of odd. It has, uh, you know, from the two 120-volt uh, lines, there's a 12,000-ohm resistor on each one. And then there's a, a variable resistor. I can't remember the value of it. I don't know if I know the value, but we'll find out. And you can turn up and down. That will vary the voltage and the current flowing in the light. I don't think, whoops, I don't think we're talking about much, much current here. I think we're talking about tiny amounts of current. Um, it's not unlike an LED in a way, and there's a few other ways in which this, uh, not the word, I want to say electro effervescence, but that's definitely not what it is. Um, the idea that you can apply electric fields or current through a solid material and have that material cast off light. That's, the, that's sort of the scientific side of this. Okay, so let's jump on the internet. We'll look at a few resources here, and uh, what I haven't found yet is uh, anybody's description of what they've done in exactly this situation. That's what I'd like to, to find. So, well, let's see what we've got here. This is probably the most interesting thing I found right here. This is on uh, in the Internet Archive, and we're looking at something from Sylvania, Technical Data Service Service. Panalescent lamps. They call them lamps. Let's zoom in just a bit on this document here. And lo and behold, what do you see? A clock face. Radar azimuth scale. And who, who's that? Is that somebody at my door? Oh my gosh, I just got started. Tractor panel. Tractor? as in tractor in the farm that's just a little surprising who, who, who needs who needs backlit oh my gosh I'm being yelled at here guess who's here guess who's come to join me here hey oh there you are you ready to go are you you think I'm coming hey peanut <laughs> he's given up he's given up did you give up he's leaving his tail behind have you given up no okay yeah I have to go and spend a little time with my cat you see they can't go out so much anymore so it's up to me to entertain them now for crying out loud here I come cat here I come well he wasn't interested in me at all he wanted to go outside so it's about two degrees outside, but the sun is shining. So he's gone out for a little bit. Great. Okay, back back to what back to what we were doing here. Track yeah, right, tractor panel. Let's just take a look at this. Sylvania panelescent lamps produced light from an area source through the action of electroluminescence. That's the word I couldn't think of. Light is generated by excitation of special phosphors dispersed between two conductive plates by an alternating electric field. The electrical action is identical to that of a conventional capacitor except that one of the plates between which an alternating voltage is applied is transparent to allow the light to be usefully transmitted. So they had to come up with a, a, uh, a conductive but clear panel. Hmm. 
Panalescent lights pro provide a uniform, low-power, rugged, highly adaptable light source. Construction a panalescent lamp consists of a base metal plate to which a series of selected coatings is applied to attain a configuration such as that shown in figure one. Here's figure one. So here we have the base metal plate. And we have a series of coatings, a ceramic coating to start. Ceramic phosphor coating next. Transparent conductive coating. I'm not saying what it is. That's probably part, part of the secret. Transparent finish coating. When they say transparent, in my case, it's not transparent like glass. It's more like frosted glass or, or like uh, China is. You know, your dinner plates are transparent to light to some degree. The manufacturing process consists of first applying and firing a ceramic coating to the base metal plate, followed by another ceramic coating in which are suspended the electroluminescent phosphors. A third coating is applied, which is transparent yet electrically conductive. Finally, a trans didn't they just tell us this? Finally, a transparent finish coating or glaze is applied. That's what's chipped on mine, the glaze coating. Uh, electrical connections to the panelescent lamps are made to the base plate and the transparent conducting layer, which together form the light capacitor. So they're applying it to the base plate. Ah, so if they were going to do that with the clips we saw, they would have sanded away all the way down to the base plate and on the other side, sand away, but only down to the transparent coating. And it looks so crudely done. Or has somebody done something to this one? This is 1964. The, the clock radio, I'm pretty sure, has to be from 1955. Next page. Things get a little technical now. Here we are. Look at this. I, I didn't really. I haven't looked at this on that carefully. I just found it and thought, well, I'll look at it right now. Typical, typical cutout. So there's a hole here, yeah, for the clock motor to poke through the, uh, the hands to, to, you know, to be mounted. Typical mounting hole. Luminous area. Non-luminous area for base electrode. Silver patch for top electrode. Silver patch. Edge clip connectors. So they're showing. You know, they're showing them to look different here surfaces feed through connectors well, what are they showing here oh there's different see the different sections here so they're able to light these in, in I guess different ways maybe maybe like this one and then like that one for some reason I guess that's what they're showing segmented lamp or maybe it's just dark in this area here Theoretically, alum electroluminescent lamps can be made in any size and shape. In practice, however, it's desirable to work in a flat or near flat surfaces. Current production offers sizes up to 2 feet by 4 feet. Thickness of the lamp is less than 50 one thousandths of an inch, 5 one hundredths of an inch, 1 twentieth of an inch. All designs must allow a non luminous area around the edge of the lamp as well as around any openings non-luminous area is also needed for the attachment of electrical contacts. A non-luminous area. Panelescent lamps are available in a variety of colors obtained by the use of various phosphors and overlays. Surface brightness of lamps of several colors under typical three typical phases of operation. That's this, figure three, table one. Okay, we don't know where to, here, here we are, table one. That's uh, just a bunch of numbers. Um, 
typical surface brightness values in foot foot Lamberts in foot Lamberts okay that's great that helps green so green green is the bright guy so green is the favored one if you want brightness a little more voltage gets you more of these other colors here but on a, a lower voltage you're talking green with a hint of yellow and a dash of blue and a pinch of white and a little bit of red thrown in just for fun. Look, here's the actual figure three. Yeah, figure three. Whoops. Show. Whoa! Come back. Where'd you go? I've lost it. It's a computer disaster has happened. Figure three shows spectral energy distribution curves for four colors of panelescent lamps. Each curve is plotted relative to its own maximum value. You know these curves indicate a smooth spectrum. Unlike fluorescent or mercury lamps, there are no mercury lines. Well, that's kind of interesting too. I'm, I'm pretty sure... Well, come on. Stop doing that. Hey. Hey. There. <laughs> yeah, I fall off your chair watching this. Oh, hey, you too. Everybody's fighting with me here. Spectral energy. So, green, blue, white, kind of in the middle, green, blue, yellow. Wavelength gets longer. Color goes towards yellow, green, blue. Green. Green is an unusual color in the world. As I understand it. Okay, what's on this page? Proper choice of phosphors and overlays, a variety of daylight and luminous colors are available. Brightness, surface brightness of electroluminescent lamp depends upon both applied voltage and frequency. That's interesting. Typical relationship brightness applied 60, la la la. While it is optically inefficient to operate a high voltage lamp substantially under voltage because of the unneeded dielectric thickness. No lamp should be operated higher than its design voltage. Now, I guess it's a great big surface going to break down. Lamp brightness also increases with frequency, but life decreases. Oh, there is a life issue here. A range of frequencies from 25 to 1,000 is suitable, but an upper limit of 400 is considered most practical. So this one's running with 60. 60. Brightness. Volts. So, so we're running... Of course, it depends where you set that adjustment. You could go, let's see, you can go, well, it never goes out. So I was wrong about you had to be above a certain voltage to sort of trigger it. It's not like neon. It's always there. Very low, 120. So this thing should be varying about double brightness. If you turn it up and down, something, something on that order. Whoa, come on. I'm just so reckless with the... Uh, mouse today. Current in milliamps, okay, that's it per square inch. So 120 volts, 60 cycles, current in milliamps per square inch. Now how many square inches are there? That's one, two, three, four. It's about six by six. That's about 40 square inches. 40 times 0.1. Four. Put four milliamps of drain through here impedance in thousands of ohms, inches per square, inches squared, so one square inch. It's very high, very high uh, resistance, 350k Fa phase angle. Well, it's a capacitor, so I guess the phase angle is off a little bit. I'm not sure why you would be too concerned about that. Why would you be concerned about that? Electroluminescent lamp not only resembles an electrical capacitor physically, but electrically, circuit-wise, it appears as a capacitor and a resistor in parallel, resulting in a leading power factor, 0.4 to 0.8. Complete electrical characteristics are shown in Table 2. Well, that's good. You need a little added capacitive reactance in your house to compensate for motors, but uh, I'm sure this is not having that effect at all. I'm joking. Electrical connections, to, you know, I joke a lot, but 
but I'm so deadpan when I do it, I think a lot of viewers, perhaps you, don't catch on to the fact that I'm laughing inside while I talk. So. <laughs> like right now. Oh, it came out of my mouth. Electrical connections to a panelescent lamp are made to the two plates, the base metal plate and the transparent conductive layer. Sil an applied silver patch is the contact surface for the latter connection. So you get right on the steel plate when they have to do something quite special to achieve the uh, other connection. Silver patch. Either edge clips or feed-through connectors are used for the actual electrical connections as shown in so-and-so. If desired, a single edge clip or feed-through connector may be used for the top electrode connection and a pressure contact on the back of the base plate completes the circuit. If it, a completely flat lighted surface is needed, the base plate may be formed with a recess, a recess, a recess, a, a, a recess to accommodate the top connection. Well, it's not really like that on this one. Of course, this, this thing we're looking at is 10 years older than this document here. Next page. What happened here? Then I, I flipped there. What more are they going to tell us? Maintenance and life. This is what I really want to get to. Panelescent lamps are available with or without connectors or leads, wires, and certain UL approved application suitable resistors can be furnished. So I was talking about the two 12K resistors. Um, that apparently helps reduce electrical noise that comes from these panels. Doing it that way. Figure 5 shows typical life characteristics of 120 volt green panelescent lamp operation at 60 volt perfect, 60 cycles. Since the end of life is seldom abrupt, lamp life is generally considered to be at the point where the brightness reaches 50% of its initial value. If the lamp is used in low ambient light, the useful end of life will be much lower brightness level. Oh, so in, in the dark, a little bit of light goes a long way. That's what they're going. Hey, buddy, don't think it's worn out just because it's at 50%. Just turn out every other light in your house and see, you can still see it. What time is it, honey? Just a moment while I turn out all the lights in the house. Now, lumen. See, now I was just joking there in case you didn't quite catch that. Okay, an electroluminescent lamp is not generally affected by ambient temperature. Okay, whoops. Oh, too many, too much clicking here. Design considerations. Panelescent lamps are extremely versatile, rugged, and cost is a prime and minimum and regular surfaces, cutouts, holes, close dimensions. Following should be furnished. The panelescent lamps must allow a non-luminous border around the periphery of the lamp as well as all cutouts and holes shown by I, I really kind of repeat things a lot in here, don't they? And here's a few of the many applications. Clock dials, auto instrument panels, I wouldn't be surprised if there's cars with this kind of lighting in them today. Night lights, can't find mine. Tractor instrument panels. Really? Radio and dial, radio and TV dials. I've never seen that. Radar consoles. Okay, that makes sense because you're probably in a dark space staring at your radar screen. Decorative lighting. Aircraft instrument panels. That's probably a main a major use of it here. Photo transparency lighting. Well, I'm not sure what they mean by that. They have a panel and you stick your photo on top of the panel and look at it as the light comes through. Signs. Signs. Signs, signs. Everywhere there are signs. And what is this? Notice the call it window. The United States Post Office notice. Well, I'm not quite sure what this is, but it looks like somebody didn't, somebody didn't pay for this when it got mailed out. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, that pretty much covers the whole story. Now I have a couple other things to look at here. Here's a shot of uh, where Chrysler got into using this kind of stuff, and I guess this is the backlit panel here. Very cool. Very cool indeed. This is nothing much here. And these are sort of the current state of affairs. More explanation for what's going on. It's much more uh, scientific and deeper. 
Look at this. You have uh, flexible materials now that have got this technique, probably just using updated materials of all sorts. There's lots here to read if you really want to get into it. There's the, the layering. Okay, I think we know. I think we know enough. We know enough to get into big trouble now. Okay, let's take a look at the panel on this radio. I'm um, pretty sure it doesn't work, so I'm not going to turn it on just to see if it works. Why don't we put a voltmeter on it here and uh, see what that will tell us. Should be able to figure out which, which way the uh, control works. brightness control on the back. Or if it works. Okay, radio off. Radio off. <laughs> Switch on the back. Okay, radio's off. So we don't need that on. We need dim bulbs just because. And we need to plug it in. Plug it in. There we go clock is running. So our panelist light should be on. Let's see what we get. 200 volt scale. What's up here? Ooh. The whole shooting match. 115. Okay, so we're supplying according to this 118. Okay, let me work the control on the back here. It's all the way one way. I'll turn it all the way. Ooh. No, it wasn't. Okay, that's all the way one way. One eighteen point seven, just about exactly the same as what's on the machine there. So that's that would be full. Works the same way a volume control would work. This would be dull. Not much difference there. How do we know if there's any current going at all? It's supposed to be, what did I say, 40 milliamps? 40 milliamps. Let's just see if I can somehow read that, this guy here. So we put this on AC, that's volts. Current two amps. Hmm. RMS AC amps. Okay. I don't know. It's a tiny, tiny current. I don't think this is going to be proof of anything here unless we see some current flowing. Oh, we got an interesting number there. So I thought it would be around 40 milliamps, and we see 50. No, that's not 50 milliamps. That's half an amp. Come on, it can't be half an amp. Set to two amps. AC. It says TRMS, true RMS. A little amp sim symbol there. Half an amp. There's half an amp flowing in this. Let's change the uh, adjustment here. Let's see what happens. Yeah, you know, do you believe that? I have trouble believing it. Half an amp is a lot. Half an amp would heat this panel up. Hmm. Hmm. So that'd be a half an amp flowing at 100 volts for easy figuring. That's 50 watts. That's a small space heater. I don't think there's any heat in here at all. It's a very small space heater. What, what's with this meter? Hmm. 
Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. So, another way to do it be to look at those 12k resistors and uh, read the voltage across them that uh, should be there. Resistors. So the wires drop through. Everybody's coming through over here. You can see one go right to this control. This is the brightness control, and there's a resistor right there. That would be the resistor. What kind of voltage is across that? It's supposed to be two resistors. And what is it? That looks like one, two, 12k that's exactly what's on the schematic zero I don't know what kind of reading we're going to get out of this either that's pretty interesting it floats to 30 well if I stick my hand over here In the early days, when uh, electric fields were of interest, especially in the power industry business, where they were making high voltage cable terminations, and they wanted to know about the electric field, because the field causes a gradient, and the gradient can cause current flow. And if you get a gradient over a surface, you can easily get a leakage over the surface, and eventually, over time, that'll turn into a pretty good short, and pow, the termination will, will fail because you're bringing up a high voltage cable and around it is a grounded outer sheath or something like that. So there's a very strong electric field. So to study these electric fields, they would take their termination, whatever it is, insulator, whatever they've done, and they would stick it on, into a vat of water or a container of water. And they would take a voltmeter and stick it with, with just tiny amounts showing here stick it in the water and move it around and they would measure the field that way in the water and that's how they came to understand that's why uh, old-time insulators if you look up on uh, uh, you know the glass insulators so many people like to collect they're curved on the surface there they're not they're not like like this they're curved why are they curved well that curve follows the electrical stress lines in such a way that over that surface there is no voltage gradient. There's no pressure pushing anything over that surface because the surface is following one of the gradient lines. And that's why they're shaped that way. So you get a succession of these coming down on your insulator and every surface has no voltage gradient on it. There's still voltage between the individual, um, you know, uh, pieces, if you like, of the, of the insulator. You know, a big insulator on a hydropole. Um, but over that surface, because after all, rain's falling on the surface, dirt's building up on it, that, that surface is going to become quite conductive. So that's, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I, I hope that's interesting. So the name, we have to put this radio underwater and we'll go like this and find out and find out. So, I, so when I'm doing this, what I'm thinking is the same thing's happening. The, uh, the probe, the wires, uh, my hands, uh, all these things are moving around in a field in air and the meter is conveying the what could only be considered the average result of everything that's going on here. And it's not much different than doing this. Wait a minute, now we got a bigger shot there and then it disappeared. Get a better grip on it here. 
but it does come down into just the nothingness, the voltage. What about across this guy here? Well, there could be a lot. Let's, let's put this up on 200. I don't think I'm going to hurt my meter any, but move the decimal point on that. Nothing. How can there be nothing? Because I got this turned to zero. Let's turn it. You know what? This way is going to be zero. I can picture the slider coming around inside. This would be zero resistance. You get zero volts. This way is going to be putting some amount of resistance in here. I can see 37 there, but I don't know what that is. I, I just think there's no current flowing in this circuit at all. That, that's the impression I keep getting. What's the value of that guy? Let me just peek myself on the uh, schematic here very quickly, if I can find it. Hello, where are you, schematic? Uh-oh. Here we are. There we are. Okay, and so the panelescent meter. That's a 500,000 ohm variable resistor in there with two 12K resistors on either side. The panel is connected to the slider according to this. R13 and R12, if I look at the uh, location of things, does it show up? They are 13 I'm just looking at a diagram here. Uh, no. What about the panel isn't control. That's not on here either. Hmm. Well, I don't, know, I don't know what to make of that. So we only have one resistor showing here. And we see there's a wire going right up and off. Now the other wires. Okay, let's follow the, the other wires in green. Don't stick your fingers back there. The other wire is a white wire this one and way up over here and there's another 12k resistor right there another 12k resistor so if we go on the supply side of the two resistors we should get 120 volts AC or something close to that supply side there it is go across the resistor here what's going on there so 119.2 on one side ooh, ooh. you know that's 119.2 there too I think okay, no current flowing they didn't say anything about really how these panels die. If they become non-conductive or if the phosphorus just doesn't glow anymore, it's just giving up the glow a little like all of us, or what. So next place to fiddle. Uh, power off, because we don't get the power on. Next thing you know, I will be playing the fiddle here, for sure. These clips. I'm going to take a really close look at that stuff. See what we can see there. Well, that's interesting right there. So, while I'm looking, I'm going to start by looking at this gap, this hole. How'd that get there? That has a curious look to it, doesn't it? It, it has a curious look to me. This thing was fractured. You'd expect some really sharp edges, but they look like rounded edges. Is that a manufacturing fault? I, I can't imagine they would let this panel come out like that. Here's another one. Yeah, it just doesn't look like a fracture. It, it looks like because the edges are not 
sharp. Hmm. Okay, we don't really know what kind of material we're dealing with here. Let's look up here. Well, that's interesting. Now, they didn't mention silver, so I, I see I see some rust, but it wouldn't, rust where there shouldn't be any steel. That's one of the uh, clock control arms sticking out there. The black looks like silver oxide to me. the other side this is done differently this is uh, so it looks like there's rust underneath the clip or is that no rust on the edges of the clip that's a little interesting too like some kind of fluid has come around from the uh, surface like the the clip is contacting that surface along the straight bent edge and at either ends of the straight bent edge if I can call it that the contact surface this rust has come around as if something is uh, crawling there from the panel the panel doesn't look rusty like it's steel but look at how deep that goes that goes through layer after layer after layer how would they get through those layers without causing a fault and you know what? I think it comes to this line here you see how this line it's very subtle. It seems to go up here, come across here. So this this is the area they talked about where it had to be a peripheral zone where they could do stuff like this. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's okay, it's turned off. So we expect to see something similar over here. Well, no, because you see this is this is goes all the way down to the bottom, all the way down to the bottom here. I guess this one you have to make contact. In fact, look, you can see it. I think you can see an edge coming up right here. Or man, it's just the way the light is on the... I think it's just the way the light is. I need to get a little bit closer with that camera. So just bear with me a moment while I uh, bring up the uh, focus dialog box here. You don't really have a choice, do you, when I say bear with me? I mean, you're... Well, you can go play with your cats for a moment. Okay, we are maximum focus now. Well, you know, made on purpose? Whacked? Somebody whacked it? Kapowie! It doesn't have that look, does it? Melted? Melted? Did it get too hot here? Something like a short inside? Would cause, say, uh, could that be possible? So you turn the brightness all the way up and you've got 24,000 ohms in series with 120 volts. You're talking a milliamps. But, you know, mi milliamps focused into a little tiny spot. These materials are ceramic. Can you melt them? This be the proverbial hot spot? Does it present an opportunity? Is it is it ruining the panel? Are these is this the problem? I definitely see kind of a silvery gray material right down at the bottom of the of the uh, canyon here. The divot. But in the lower right corner, that material seems to be missing. Instead, it's white. It's whitish. There's the uh, surface material here. I don't think that's dirt on it. I think that's actual stuff uh, embedded right, right in the surface, the black dots. Because you can see some of them are at the surface and others are a little bit below. They look a little out of focus. Is there anything interesting here? I had to poke a hole through it. There you can see the, uh, again, the, the clearance to poke a hole. You can see a lot of rust. Staining. Rust staining. Rust. It's probably coming over the surface. And there's the adolescent lamp. Adolescent lamp. 
Okay, taking a really close look now. So, yeah, I'm asking myself things like, you know, sh should I get out the sandpaper and abrade this? And then move the clip onto where I've abraded it? Probably. And this one here, this, see, this does not look the same as this. There's no black buildup over here. It certainly is here, and look, it's kind of flowed around. It's, it's gotten out of its zone there and come down the panel a little wee bit, especially at this far end. It's right over the surface of the panel. Why, why silver? Why would they apply silver? Look at, okay, so I can see now, I'm looking right at that, uh, uh, what is it, I believe, is a piece of silver. And it's corroded away all around its edges. Kind of looks a little like England on its side. Not really. Turn it upside down, maybe it looks like the, uh, now I can't operate the camera. So in the upper area here, I'm going to have to steady up the camera here just a sec. So the upper area in here discolored. Looks a little pitted. So did they, what, did they just grind this away and then down to the right level? How would you ever do that? So, and then there's rust down there. Need something better to poke with. Pretty, pretty solid. See, what if I clean this surface up and slide the clip off the horrible rust here? So, what I believe is silver rust. Just get a little better lighting on it. So if I scrape this black stuff off, there's no metal underneath it. The same over here then, no, no metal underneath it anyway. It's all turned into uh, whatever this is, silver, silver, who, who knows, silver dioxide, silver, silver oxide is probably what it is. It would strike me, the only hope is that this, this, this clip goes on this bit of metal here and somehow the whole thing comes to life. Do we leave the other clip? We should leave the other clip alone because it looks like it's okay, who knows? This one is sitting on top of a pile of rust so it appears. Now how strong is that clip? That clip could be monstrously strong here. So I'm going to try lifting it. Just to get a feel for it. pretty strong just as you would imagine if you look at, at this you see again right around right around the edges here whoops whoop, bump my camera right around the edges here some advanced corrosion attack yeah it could be silver migrating up on there who knows what kind of electrochemical reactions going on on this stuff. So this looks like a plated material too, because it looks like the plating is coming off right in here. Chances are this is steel. Steel is springy, a lot of other metals aren't very springy, but steel is springy, so you can make a spring and make it out of steel. Steel rust, so you coat it. So you coat it with whatever, whatever they use here, something, something nice and shiny, something that's maintained its shininess. 
So what's going on in the back side of this? I don't know. Um, so probably if now if I slide this over into this area, unfortunately the clip is going to run into this this metal up here. Okay, I've only got this this distance, and a tiny little bit of silver here. Hmm. Um, and for all I know, if I lift this clip up, there's a nice piece of silver right underneath it. But, yeah, that's a fat chance on that. I'm taking the clip right off the radio here. Not like that. I need my, uh, let's see, pretty strong pair of pliers. Can't get under it. About a weak pair of pliers. A bit of green in there. It doesn't I just set it there. It doesn't doesn't look like the clip came all the way down into the cleared area. I like guess all looks white here. Maybe maybe the clip contact was starting here. I expect a nice line all the way across. There it is. Nice line right here. braid all this away. This is probably loosely adherent material. No, it's not. It's not loose at all. I'm going to make a temporary connection to this. Even even just a, a point contact like, like I'm doing right now. Try to shoot energy into this and see if the light comes on. What is this? What is this part here? The rusty part. Don't understand where the rust has come from. Unless, unless it's not rust. It almost looks like the clip was there at one time, but I don't think so. Okay, sounds like I should make just a clip a wire onto the, onto the, uh, onto this, and then just run it on, and just touch it up against this, see if the panel comes on. That sounds like a good, a good first attempt at something. First attempt at something. What if this falls off and bangs into the radio? I think that's a bad. That's a bad. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Okay, I'll bring it off myself. Because I'm going to be moving this around, I can't keep my eye on both ends of it. Temporarily cover this up here. Okay, now I'm going to do this kind of in the dark, sort of. Let's darken down the room. Some ambient light coming in from a window next door. Looks like it's glowing right now. I have to have enough light to see what I'm doing. I'm really, really just going to kind of do this thing. Okay. What did I 
I do with my lights here? Uh, what happened to my lights? Well, I'm in the dark. I'm in the dark about my lights. So we're going to switch over to this light here. I'm going to close my door. We get no window light coming in. Okay, we're going to turn on the power. Clock is running. Off with the light. Just by the light of my computer screen, basically. Now I'm going to the light get myself ready here. Right in this area. Let's just make sure this is turned up. Full blast. That's full blast. goes. It's on. Huh. You can make a good connection here. I'm scraping off what's left of it. Wow. Very neat. So what's happened is my uh, door is <laughs> my door is somewhat open. Ooh, something. Who did that? Nobody. There. I won't swing open now. Okay, let me just double check where I'm doing this. Doing it right on that little strip of uh, what would be good silver, I think. And there it is. Well, I'm surprised. Now, how do you make a connection to that? <clears throat> you would, uh, you would what? Uh, the clip just won't get over there. How far over can we go? again. This is the area the clip can reach. Phew, right on the edge. And I think if we look at it, we will see that there's just a tiny amount. So if we look at the edge of that metal there. Hey, you know what? This is on. Let me turn it off before I get a surprise. Okay, so we're looking, oh, just barely. Wow. The other thing, too, is the clip that's here, and that's now all taped up. The clip, the clip surface itself might be bad, but I guess we could just probably sand that back to life. But getting the clip to clip onto that... Yikes. Is there any way, is it, is it underneath that black stuff? If I sand away that black stuff, when we end up with something, what, what harm could it do? This area is, is uh, built to expose this particular layer, which according to what I read, they throw silver on. Silver, probably because the silver, uh, well, look, has a long life. Ha ha. Um, so my wife grew up in a town called Espanola. Espanola is a paper town. It has a big paper mill. It has a river with a small waterfall. So they located the paper mill there because they could generate electricity to run the paper mill. Big paper mill. 
Um, the paper mill produces a lot of this pungent gas whose name I can't think of. Uh, sulfur. The rotten egg stuff. Um, you go into my wife's house where she grew up and pull out their silverware and it looked like this. Well, it wasn't this egregious, but it all turned black from this gas in the air. So if you put this radio, this radio was in Espanol, it would end up looking like this. Espanol is known for its uh, stink. Sorry if you're in Espanol, sorry to say that, but uh, that, that is your claim to fame, stinky town. On the other hand, if this was kept away from all gases somehow, kept in a plastic bag, I don't know how you'd do that, this might still look like silver. So my perception of this is the silver has completely corroded away up in here. Now these small strips that are still, you can still make contact with, aren't extending down under the white stuff here, they, they are laying right on the surface that needs to be energized. So a little bit goes a long ways. You put 40 milliamps through that? Is that what I was just doing to make this thing glow? 40 milliamps? 40 milliamps, that's... That's not a small amount, particularly small amount. Okay, what I gotta do is I gotta stop now, ponder the options here, dream up some way to go forward. Does it involve a soldering iron, trying to solder to that? Why didn't they solder to it? Because probably the heat destroys the, uh, destroys the materials. There's a reason why they're using clips here. They know clips aren't the best. But you saw on the internet, clips, clips were the way it was always done. Could I, could I somehow reapply the silver? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just go to my chest of silver and gold and get some out. Yeah, I'm going to give this some time now to think. It's a uh, quarter after five on this clock, but the real time is 11. And new time because we changed the clocks last night. Okay, I got to think about this a little bit. Okay, so I've been reading all about soldering silver things together it's a mostly a jewelry issue of course and in that case soldering requires tremendous strength so the uh, soldering soldering instructions for silver usually involve a hard high temperature uh, solder technique using a blowtorch and uh, you know you're working on jewelry well i'm not about to pull out a blowtorch on this um, so, but it does look like it is possible to make solder stick to, like regular solder, my shop solder, stick to the silver. And uh, so there's some opportunity here to, to lay a wire across the uh, remaining silver and then attempt to solder onto it. Um, I think that comes with a lot of problems. Just doing that, having it done so it stays so if you move the wire you don't just rip what remaining silver is there and that's the end of that so to get a, a successful repair here I would say it would take a finely stranded copper wire well cleaned attempt it to clean this in some way the silver that's on here and I'm not sure how you do that um, then I try to solder the fine wires uh, on mass onto this silver surface, surface in hopes of getting some contact and have the wire uh, fixed in place in such a way that you work with the wire like uh, trying to attach this clip to it or something of that sort. Um, you won't have, uh, you won't stress it and pop it off because I, I just imagine there's no strength to the silver, the little tiny bit of silver that's on here. 
maybe just before I go and eat my lunch, another close look at it might be a good thing to stick in my in my head. Yeah, soldering onto that. Just look at that surface. That's not shiny silver. That's a horrifying surface. And that's all there is, all the way along here. Nowhere else. I can't figure out uh, how to apply a clip onto here. Um, I, I can't figure that one out. And uh, wow, that, that surface is just terrible. Yeah, really. I don't know. I'm going to go eat a sandwich and see what I can come up with. Maybe sort of like the cat's whisker type, type deal. Like it's sort of a spring-loaded pin. God knows how he would do that. And just poke the pin into the solder. Is that going to be good for 40 milliamps, was it? I'm not sure 40 milliamps is right. Okay, but a sandwich would be good now. Because it's nearly noon. Great. Very good, ham and cheese sandwich, very good. Now, thinking about what to do about this. Uh, I'm still kind of hanging on the idea of trying to solder something onto the remnants of the silver there. Um, and I think maybe the first step is to just to try to wipe some solder onto it and just see if that can be done. Uh, every step I take could be the last, the last step. So I'm not uh, rushing into this um, because it would be pretty cool if this if this were to light up properly. Well, that's the, that's the best idea I've got. As for trying to clean the silver, I just don't see how. If I abrade it, I will just scratch it right off. It will be gone. Try to stick acid or something on there. I have no idea what the chemistry uh, should be for for doing something like that. And you know, I don't have a good chemistry set here of acids and other stuff to, to try. And that's why I'm kind of stuck with just throw try to just throw some solder on there and see if it'll uh, stick. Hmm. But I do want to think about, you know, one thing about making this panel glow when I was dragging the uh, light across it, it indicates that this clip is working over here. Okay, I'm going to let those ideas settle in just a little bit further here before I actually attempt something. Okay, well my intention is to try to stick some solder onto that and it just looks, it just looks totally impossible. Maybe not. Maybe it is. Maybe it's more metal than I realize. Yeah, I'm not. Not this is not sticking solder on it yet. You can see little little bits of it way up in here. Probably it ran all the way across. Okay, let's heat up the soldering iron. Now, regular silver, like real silver soldering, like as in jewelry, requires like a thousand degrees to, it's more, more, uh, more, more closely aligned with welding, I think, than soldering or brazing. Now, I've got a couple of different solders here, but I think basically they're all the same. Um, so the one I would choose to use is the one I use all the time does it say on it? Does it say anything special on it? Attention. That's in French. Mr. Chemicals. It's got RA flux. RA flux. 2.2% flux. 6337 mix. So it's. I think that makes it eutectic. This means it melts at the lowest temperature. And uh, 
here's the end of the solder here. Who hid the end of it? There's, there's no end. There it is. Okay, so the soldering iron is set to a relatively low temperature. Start with. And let's watch what happens here. The ceramic materials are uh, put a little on the back of the soldering iron. Oh yeah, it's sticking. Okay, let's apply more here. I gotta change the lighting. Let's change the lighting. Hey, this is gonna work. I think it's gonna work. Okay, we're gonna put bunch on here. It goes on and comes off. Ooh. What's happened? It's all gone dark. Sticking it. Oh, there's a little blob. You just leave that on there. <laughs> the only, the only piece. Now, what actually happened to the silver? Did it disappear? Did I kind of burn it? Well, I wasn't on it. That's why it stuck where it stuck. I guess because I tilted the, uh, the view here a little bit. Let's try again. Smear the solder across. Looks like you get one shot at it, and that little tail end there has some solder. I'm not going to stop now. Looks like the more I try, the worse it gets. Okay, so we got a little bit of solder stuck there. Now, what I got to think about is the wire. How am I going to uh, how am I going to hold a wire there? Hmm. Hold a wire. It's got to be held up. Yeah, just like that, up against it. And I gotta put a soldering iron on it with solder. Tin, tin the. Uh, I should, I should figure out how to fix the wire to the radio back here. I could even glue it or something like that. And the wire come around. Oh my gosh! When you slide this into the cabinet, what happens here? That's a good question. What happens? Does a part of the cabinet come up and pinch it? I don't know. Let's just take a look. Let's see what's up here. There's a distinct bordering shape here. Uh, you cannot you cannot see these through the front, of course. But you can see all this. But you cannot see that. This and that. 
gives an idea where the border is going. And there's an opening down here. It's recessed so the pointer can, can go through. So this part probably presses up tight onto the uh, onto the clock face. So if I, if I have a wire here just going back over, what the clips were there. The clips were there. Well, the clips were there. Maybe may let's look at that. Where do you go again? Maybe the, uh, if we look, you can see where the holes are for the knobs to come through. These knobs are right up against the the, the body here. So this piece is riding well below these clips. So that means if the clip and its wire had space, my wire would have space too. Okay. Okay, just trying to think of everything that can go wrong so it doesn't go wrong. So why wouldn't I just cut the wire from here and try to solder this wire on? Why wouldn't I do that? Let's just unplug this to be super duper safe here. <laughs> Clips of no use, pretty sure. So I just un unsolder the wire. Use the original wire. Just bring it down. So I, I don't want the wire to tug on this material because I'm pretty sure if I manage to solder it and then uh, I let the uh, wire tug on it, it'll come off. It'll pull the uh, pull what's left of the silver off. So I need some way to make this wire sit where I want it. It's a stranded wire, so it kind of has a bit of a mind of its own, along with that insulation, too. You know, if I put the clip back on here, I could could have something under the clip that comes across. It makes contact with the solder I've put on there. It's like a clip extension. Like a very stiff piece of metal. You can tuck the clip up this tight. A piece of flat metal. I should try that first maybe before trying to solder to it. I've raised this with a bit of solder. What I need is some kind of stiff material like steel. Steel is just not the best. Well, let me do some experimenting here. I thought I better, I was going to experiment with this big piece, but then I thought, well, if I get it on there and everything works, then I'm going to have to take it off and do it over again, and maybe it's not going to work second time around. So, so I'm going to cut what I think I need here. scissors better. This is actually not the thinnest metal, which is good. It's painted on one side, but the other side is nice and shiny. The idea is to put that on there and then apply the clip. In the course of doing that, I'm going to rough everything up. Plus, I would want this bent into a spring shape. So it's springing down on here. That's going to be pretty tough to get that underneath this. here. How hard is this to go on? Put the 
this in place Whoops. and then fish this other piece up under it. Well, I'll be. Let's see if this works. Did this work? Okay. Lights out. Power on. Just one more light yet. Power, power. Everything okay here? Nope. Power on. Okay, motor's going. I don't see any light, but it's pretty bright in here. And off with the lights. Well, I don't think it's glowing. Now, did I fiddle with the control at the back here? Is that not, is that glowing? <laughs> I don't think so. Can't get rid of any more light. There's nothing on the camera at all. Now you can kind of see the face of it there. I don't think that's glowing. Okay, clock is definitely moving. Yes. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna try wiggling that clip a little bit here and there, um, bearing in mind electrocution as soon as possible. Make sure this is turned up all the way. How do you wiggle that thing? Um, just try moving it a little bit. Okay, back to the darkness. short this against those uh, little uh, clock knobs. Why, why wouldn't this have worked anyway? Oh, I know why it didn't work. I know why it didn't work. Say it again. I know why it didn't work. I, I've clipped this onto the painted side. That's the problem with this. Really, really, really adherent paint. Well, I think I have the idea, but I just don't have the right material. Could have thought of that. Yeah, I did think of it. Okay, new piece of metal. Watch my own meter. Very good. Painted side. Hey, what's going on there? Painted side. Metal side. Other alternate piece of tin. Looks good to me. Okay, so we're going to cut the strip here. The thought of that paint on one side is going to be trouble. Cut it about the same. This is not as strong, this, this metal. It's a little bit thinner, unfortunately. Now we're trying to make contact with a bump of solder, so I don't need a, a toothy thing. I need a flat. I need a flat. I'll even curl back a little bit. still there.
You son of a gun. <laughs> Safety in the shop. Let's turn the power off. Let's unplug it. It was like very, very mild, that shock I just got. I could hardly feel it, but uh, scary nevertheless. Oh, how stupid can you be? I'm playing with a potentially a, an electrode. This thing here is right on the outlet. Okay, let's turn it back on. Did I see it come on? Did it just come on? No, not that big light, the big light. The big, it's on! Son of a gun. I like to, oh, it's, it's on, why, why was it flipping there? Did I, was that my imagination? Brightness going up and down a little bit. It's very weak in the uh, camera, but uh, looking at it with my eye in a dark room, it's pretty dark in here. Uh, that looks great. I can see the second hand going around. Let's adjust the level just to see what happens. Okay, here we go. Down, down, up, up. I can cheat it into being brighter, or does it get much brighter? Maybe it doesn't get much brighter than this. So it's right off on the. Oh no! So I can still see it barely myself. Yeah, same as the camera, but it looks much better with the eyeball. The camera's gotten so much noise in the uh, video image. Well, I'm really impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. So I could, I could first of all turn the power off and then plug it. I could slide this clip over further and put more pressure on it. Is it worth doing? Why would I want to do that? Do you think that's 40 milliamps going through there? Okay, it is unplugged. Let's see if I can slide this clip. This is, this is where I go from having it fixed to uh, ruining it. Does not want to move. Not much, not much pressure out here. Well, you know what? It is really close to this. It's close, closer. Well, go a little bit. You can slide the whole metal band this way. The whole the whole kit and caboodle. Wow, it just doesn't want to slide. Is it because I'm really not loosening it? Maybe that's what it was. Oh she's oh she's going places. Okay, that's a whole new deal. That's much closer. We better look at how close I got to the metal frame here because on account of sparks would fly. There we go. That would be the ideal situation there, except the, 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 the tin has slipped out. Oh, this whole thing moved just so easily. Looks like the other clip. There's about a millimeter clearance. There's about a millimeter clearance. Check it and see. Check it and see. Yeah, look at that. Okay, you saw it, and I saw it. We'll probably never see it again, because the room has to be really quite dark. <laughs> so, uh, but that's cool. That's cool. I, I wonder what kind of life these things actually have. 
and I suspect they have a long, long, long life. And that that is hardly dull from how it was when it was new. It's probably ah, it's got to be duller. Maybe it's 25% of what it was when it was new. Maybe that's a realistic estimate. Okay, you know what? Goes back in the cabinet now, and we take a look at it. Fantastic. There it is, glowing away. And it shows, what, about 2.13 on that clock or so? Hey, that's what time it is, 2.13. Fantastic. And now for a great unveiling. You know, I'm very poor at doing this kind of sort of unveiling thing. There it is. Walter, Mr. Louie, are you happy with what's happened to your handiwork from so many years ago? I hope so. This is the closest thing I had to somebody who's curling. That's not curling. And again, this award went out to Pam Behan, Ruby Ingram, Mabel Dilworth, and Stuffy Reed, The Skip. Donated by West End Radio Limited. Walter Louie. Well, let's listen to it. Okay, flipped it on. Let's see, tune it to this would be just about the right spot right here. Not bad, eh? I only did just put some oil on the wood and just clean things up and polish things up a little bit. Nothing too spectacular. Very tough picking up AM radio down here in my shop. So, here we are. Thank you very much for watching and uh, very happy with how this came out. I had a lot of trepidation about even taking it on at all, but uh, fantastic. I'm really happy with that. So thanks a lot and uh, enjoy your day.